And Didi Silva, welcome to Listening with Leaders. You are the co-founder and CEO of Hotel Emporium, which can be found at hotelemporium.com. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your backstory. Oh, well, first of all, before I go there, just so so the audience knows, Hotel, Hotel Emporium sells amenities to hotels, very high-end amenities. And so when you go into a hotel, a really high-end hotel, and you see the stuff in the bathroom and you know the, the soaps and the, the conditioners and all that stuff, it probably comes from Hotel Emporium. So, so people know that. But tell us the background and how you got into the business. How we got into the business, actually, I'll start. Uh, um, actually, my because of my uncle, I got into the business. In the uh, early 90s, 1991, he was managing a hotel in Newport Beach. And on a Friday, uh, the guy who was supplying all the hotel amenities, uh, he wouldn't show up. So uh, hotels, you know, obviously cannot run without the shampoos and the soaps. And uh, he ended up going to Walmart, filling the whole hotel and kept calling the, uh, the supplier who was his friend too at this time. And, you know, those days we had those phones, you like, you know, those rotary, phones, circles, rotary phones. And uh, so he kept calling, he wouldn't answer. Monday comes, the, his, uh, the guy calls and he said, uh, my uncle's name is James. James, uh, uh, I had a heart attack and I want to sell this business because I promised my wife I want to get out of it. So long story short, my uncle goes, refinances his house and ends up buying this little uh, liquid filling factory in uh, Anaheim, California. So we have a huge family in Orange County uh, in Southern California, and uh, he got his sisters, uh, nephews, nieces working in the factory. He learned the business. So how, somehow the operation wasn't running right, and uh, in mid-90s, he closed it, but he learned the business. And he started selling amenities for a different company from the East Coast, and he kept doing it. So uh, when I when uh, I was born and raised in Sri Lanka, a small island off the coast of uh, India, and uh, so my father was a hotel supplier as well. He had a hotel distribution network in Sri Lanka in this little island, and uh, at a very young age, I saw how he works. And uh, being an entrepreneur, I realized all the professionals, most of them at least, were end up working for a businessman at the end of the day. And so I thought this is what I exactly wanted to do. But uh, right out of, out of high school, I told my dad, uh, I wanted to join you. I don't want to, because we had a, it was a war-torn country at that time. We had a civil war. So we had a waiting period to go to the university. So I was never interested in that path and a few years to actually go. So I, then my dad is like, if you're ready, come with me. If you're not ready, don't come because you've seen uh, the work I put in. So uh, he trained me. I used to call him, uh, call that the Hitler training, right? <laughs> he would wake me up at 5.30 in the morning. Then uh, I'll have to load up box trucks. We were selling all kinds of milk products, uh, ice cream, cheese, butter, yogurt, and stuff, and deliver it to all the hotels in Colombo, which is the main city in Sri Lanka. So after a year, a year and a half, I was working 12, 15 hour days. And um, my um, dad and I didn't see eye to eye. Being father and the son, we got into a lot of headbutting. And... Uh, then the next thing he, uh, my mom is like, hey, you got to go back to school. So I went back to school. Then um, something funny happened. Uh, I, uh, I um, my best friend, I, I'm pretty tall for a Sri Lankan. I'm 6'2 in height. And my best friend is like, hey, you have to join modeling in this region. I'm like, I'm not a model, man. Like, you know, and then the next thing is, uh, he applied for myself, sent a picture, of, took a, a picture of mine from my mom and applied I, and for this model of the contest in Sri Lanka. This is the first time I'm talking about it, actually. I ended up winning it, right? And then the next thing, I, Sri Lankan Airlines, uh, which is the national uh, airline career, and they, uh, I got a job with them. And uh, so I was making money from both sides and getting a bit like, you know, a uh, uh, bit, bit of the popularity and all that stuff. Then uh, I got the visa to come to the U.S., migrated here. And when I came here, the main reason, you won't believe why I got into the I got into doing a business um, because I work for hotels. My uncle put me into hotels. He's the one who told me how to dream big and all that stuff. And I, uh, when I joined the hotels, I realized vacation is only two weeks in the U.S. You know, when you start working for a corporate company. And uh, I come from a country where I had like 40 to 50 days of vacation in the Sri Lankan Airlines national career. And uh, I'm like, there is no way I can 
uh, I have two weeks vacation because we, I was used to that lifestyle of having a lot of uh, time off to do travel and do other stuff. So uh, then I told my uncle, hey, let's do something together. I was climbing up on the ladder on the hotels as well at that time. And uh, he's like, hey, I know I have a passion in this hotel supply, selling amenities. He's like, if you are ready, I'm ready because I came up with a pretty good uh, operational background from my sales. Uh, my dad and my uncle had the sales background. So it was a perfect match. So we started in my garage uh, in Anaheim, California. Again, I had a little house there and uh, started it. And here we are after uh, 25 years. Wow. And you you source your products all over the world. Yes. At this moment, we source it from actually we source it from some factories in the U.S., Mexico, uh, China, Sri Lanka, um, Malaysia, and so on, India, and so on. Yeah. So what exactly does Hotel Emporium provide? Uh, at this moment, we are kind of in a, we are diversifying the business a little bit, but mostly 80% of our business, I would say we are manufacturing all the soaps, shampoos, lotions, conditioner, all the little toiletries. We call them in-room amenities in hotels. So uh, that's what we do. And and is your market primarily luxury markets or do you go up the whole, whole uh, strata of hotels? Uh, actually, we go a whole across from the motels all the way to the luxury market. But our strength is in the mid scale from three to four star properties. That that would be like eighty percent of our mm -hmm. business right now. Wow! Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So so and, and you're the CEO and founder. How many employees do you have? In the US, we have about thirty two employees, uh, and globally, I would say about one hundred and twenty. So it's not a big organization. It's not. It's not. But you. But you're obviously staying very busy, and you've been a, yeah. succeeded. You've been in business for, for what over twenty years now. Yes. Yes. Wow. So you've been doing this for a long time, Andy. What is it that gets you really excited to get up in the morning? So uh, I. I think I was born to be an entrepreneur. So. Uh, I I am not actually I, I don't chase the money. Uh, what gets me excited? I travel a lot. What gets me excited is like a friend of mine. Now I go to some place in Guatemala and see my products in a hotel, right? That gets me going because you know coming from a little island, third world country, and you see these things, you know, uh, in some island or sometimes my friends would uh, Facetime me and say, "Hey, look at this. Uh, uh, we are in Jamaica. We see your products here." You know, so. That that's a big deal for me. So it's got to be really exciting to see your products in hotels around the world. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, really it's unbelievable sometimes. Yeah. So what is it that you think is unique about you that you bring to the business that's made it so successful? So ours is primarily a family business and uh, unique about me. Uh, uh, I think uh, my, uh, building up my team, I, I have an amazing team and I feel like all uh, this, we have like four cousins working together, right? Wow. So, yeah. So, uh, and uh, my uh, biggest challenge would be managing the personalities, you know, uh, plus my uncle and the whole family dynamics. Plus, I feel like uh, all of our employees are an extension of us. We spend more time at work more than we even spend time at home with our loved ones, like family members. So I feel like, you know, uh, we can go as far as our team goes as, uh, and also treat the people the way you want to be treated. Don't feel, make them feel like they're employees. Not only feel them, make me, them a part of your whole, whole agenda, you know? And um, I make sure... Um, I listen to everybody starting from my warehouse guys to drivers all the way up to the management, you know, and uh, uh, it gets me uh, going, you know, so. So it sounds like you've got a people first philosophy in the way that you run things. Absolutely. Um, tell us about some of the challenges you've had uh, along the way. Oh, lots of challenges. One thing, uh, you know, uh, my first language wasn't... Uh, uh, English growing up in a country and when I came here learning the lingo and you know uh, and learning the sales pitch back in the day I had I still have a thick accent back in the day I would call people on do cold calling and I'll say something they wouldn't understand then I'll hang up the phone right then 
practice on my accent a little bit. I'll call, you know, these are the problems immigrants have at the beginning. Then once the business took off, actually, um, one of the biggest challenges were um, we started with these little tubes and bottles in hotels. And uh, uh, in 2000. Uh, 18 California put a ban on it after 2023, which is this year. You cannot have little uh, tubes and bottles, plastic bottles in uh, hotel rooms. So uh, most of our business was primarily on packaging these little bottles and tubes. And then it was a big challenge. Then we have to innovate products. Uh, now we can have bulk bottle, bulk dispensers, and all this stuff. So innovation became a huge part of it. So that pivot, a lot of people, some of our competition even uh, took off and they started doing cosmetic products instead of staying in hotel space. So we decided, hey, let's innovate and uh, see, uh, innovation is the key, you know? So that challenge, uh, changing the mindset of like coming up with new innovative products was a big challenge. And fortunately, like, you know, since this change started, our business started growing too, because uh, we were a step ahead than our competition because we got into innovations. So you're uh, you're really big into environmental sustainability. Tell me about that. Yes, we are. Uh, so that's that's what like we, one of the challenges we had too because the little plastic bottles and the tubes uh, they weren't environmentally friendly at all uh, when you really look at it. And then uh, uh, we actually uh, look, uh, what what I did was like I went to went around the world. Uh, looking for new sort of uh, type of packaging then um, we created a, a package called ecopod it's uh, made out of uh, paper 100% paper it's uh, and uh, the shampoos and the soaps all of them uh, none of them have synthetic chemicals they are, they are in powder form so uh, we uh, put this uh, powder into a pot and put a lid and in the shower you put water into it right it just uh, becomes shampoo or conditioner and this is something um, I'm really we won some awards on it for you know innovation and stuff so those kind of packaging uh, we have come up with where our competition hasn't so far as well as uh, we are most of our plastic whatever you use we try to uh, we do only recycle materials so we try to stay in that space and uh, come up with new products actually I'm innovating some products which is going to come next year i'm not at the liberty of saying it All right so in this sustainable space uh so that's just a constant it's just a constant uh constant job of innovating and trying to make things more sustainable greener less waste less plastic yeah how are your customers taking to that uh, we have a lot of mixed feelings on this subject actually because uh some people this this cute little tubes and bottles have been there for a long time right and some people um, they, they don't want to change it most of the countries they're still using it so uh, plus like when you go to bulk dispensers there's two types so one of them is refillable so hygiene wise it's not a great product to be honest with you because there's no cleaning practices in most of the places so customers don't like it that much even i see a trend now uh, mostly women and uh, some men too they carry their own products to hotels when they go because they are worried about the cleanliness of the dispensers in the room so you have mixed feelings so uh, we have two types of products we have large uh, dispensers one-time use dispensers with recyclable material uh, which goes on uh, the walls so uh, and refillable systems as well so so customers, to answer your question, they have mixed reviews on this. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so how often do you, are, are you, are you in charge of sales? I'm in charge of all aspects of Hotel Emporium, yeah. Oh, okay. As well. yeah. So do you get to go out and visit with, with the customers at hotels? Yeah, yeah. I still like, uh, initially, uh, our customer base was in Southern California mostly. Right. So I still go visit them. You know, these guys were the guys who helped us in our journey at the beginning. You know, you cannot forget your roots. So I see them and also I randomly go on sales calls and I'll uh, go visit people, uh, corporate meetings and all, everywhere. Yeah. Are, are most of your customers in Southern California or are, you, or are you selling all over the world? All over the world. We're in 55 plus countries right now. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. How big is your sales force? Our sales force in the U.S. we have about eight people. That's uh, good. 
Wow. Yeah, the outside sales. I mean, right. doing knocking on inside sales uh, for four people, and uh, internationally we have about another six. Mm. Yeah, and and I take it also that people uh, people hotels or hotel chains can order off your website. No, actually, this uh, our industry because logistics are so complicated. Uh, they can order off our website for independent hotels and stuff, but. Uh, mostly it's through distributors. Oh, okay. So we have distributors all, all throughout the world. We uh, can literally supply anywhere in the world right now. So, I, so you 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 sell your products to distributors who yes. sell to the hotel chains. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's why our sales force is sorry. Uh, that's why our sales yeah. force is a little small because we we have a large sales force with the distribution. We assist them with the sales. Right. I, so yeah, they are like our extension of our sales as well. Right. So. So the distributors are doing the sales and your people are acting as sort of experts. Experts, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. Got it. Um, so tell me about listening. How important has listening been in the growth of your business? It's huge, actually. Yeah, it's funny. Like today I had a call with a sales team and I was just telling them listening because uh, one guy was talking over us and I was uh, preaching that, you know, because uh, I feel like um, you know, uh, listening is one of the most important things in a sale. In a sale, because if you don't hear the customer's wants and the needs clearly, without thinking and trying to sell other products, whatever comes to your mind, you're going to lose a lot of focus from the customer. And uh, so, listening is one of the most important skills in a sale, I believe. And how have you how have you cultivated that in the company? Because you said earlier it was a people first company. Have you cultivated listening in the company, teaching people how to listen? I try as much as I can. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's a pretty big challenge actually because we have pretty upbeat personalities, you know, and uh, some of them are born bred as salespeople, but they think they can overcome everything by talking, you know, more than yeah. listening. So plus some of my family members as well. So sometimes I pull them back and say, hey. Because we have some, some uh, actually, uh, one of the girls, she's amazing. She listens. She she doesn't really talk that much either. But uh, I take her as an example. Uh, and I'm like, sometimes when you listen, you can get a lot more done than trying to be aggressively selling something, you know? So, yeah, I try to, I try as much as I can. When I work with salespeople, I teach them that for the first five minutes of any meeting, they should not be, they shouldn't do anything but listen. Oh, wow. They don't, don't even don't even begin to talk until you listen first. No, and, and I I have listening. I see listen. I, the way I break it down is there are two types of listening: type one listening and type two listening. And type one listening is where you're listening for information. You're trying to get information to make a decision, for example. Um, and type two listening is where you're listening to validate the speaker and the speaker's emotions. And it's the type two listening that's the most powerful because when you tell people how they are with their emotional experiences, they feel deeply hurt and validated. And so in sales training, I'll teach I will teach salespeople, listen to your listen to your guests' emotions and reflect back what they're feeling. And they will feel so deeply heard they'll follow you anywhere because they sure. feel really deeply listened to. Actually, a good lesson. Yeah, a good lesson. I I, I can. I can talk to my team about it. I wish I can bring somebody like you and talk to them. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I want to talk. What about the family dynamics? You've got, uh, you've got a bunch of family members. You said you had at least four cousins. What other family members are involved in the business? So uh, uh, my uncle, myself, and uh, my uncle's son. Okay. Older son, uh, who is a business development manager, and he hits marketing as well. And then uh, we have a global sales manager who's one of my my mom's sister's uh, son, and my brother handles all the sourcing around the world. Wow. So yeah, so four of us are cousins. So all Sri Lankans, all of Sri Lankans. I would say my brother and I are the migrants. The other two cousins, you know, they're pretty. One was born in New York. The other one was pretty young when he came here. They're pretty much wow. American. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Do you have any family dynamics that you have to deal with? Yes. <laughs> wow, yeah, we have like 35 of us just around in Orange County and LA area. So, um, so tell, tell us, how do you manage the family dynamics? I try to uh, stay away from the noise. It's not like, you know, sometimes <laughs> like, yeah, 
<laughs> because sometimes you can discipline somebody then the next thing you might get a call from your auntie or your mom hey, what happened because word goes around so fast right our family is kind of like that my big fat greek wedding movie it's kind of like everybody's <laughs> in everybody's business so i try to my hardest thing is like you know be the boss during the daytime and on the weekends or the evenings or whenever be the cousin you know so balancing that is a uh, was a huge challenge not anymore so Oh, yeah, I would I would I find that in these kinds of especially we have a large extended family involved in the business defining the boundaries yeah of the relationship and roles is very important sure and and if, there, if you don't have well-defined boundaries then you're going to end with chaos yeah at, that, at the beginning I, it was like that I, I agree with 100 percent so I had to like you know put put my foot down and say this is your role this is what you're going to do this is the boundary and you know now Actually, now everybody is like I said, I think they're tuned. And on the flip side, I love it because we'll win one big account, then our family and my extended family, everybody we enjoy it. You know, we talk about it, we'll do staff trips and so on. So yeah, I mean it can be very rewarding. Yeah. To together with as a family and all see all see financial and business success in a business that you're all working in. Yeah. Something that you can all be really proud of. Sure. So um so what do you see going on in the future for Hotel Emporium? Future for Hotel Emporium is going to be in the innovation space. Uh, so we are get, doing a lot of innovations right now. And uh, so I feel like, and also we are diversifying into other uh, uh, places in within the hotel space, which is our strength. We've uh, invested and we uh, bought a piece of a company. It's a micro market solution for hotels. Back in the day, you used to have a lot of vending machines in every hotel, every floor. Now they have a little... Kind of like a mini 7-Eleven when you enter a right. hotel. Right. So uh, our sis, one of our sister companies, they uh, developed this software. to uh, It's called Grab, Scan, Go. And uh, we partnered with them. And uh, we handled the sales and marketing side of it. So we are diver, diver, because we have a huge portfolio and we can put them in front of all the hotels. So we are developing that as well as uh, other products. Because we have in the US, give or take 18 to 20,000 hotels buying products from us so uh yeah so <laughs> we, we are finding other products to plug into the system right now so which uh, yeah so you're looking for ways to diversify diversify yeah products into into your existing customer base exactly and is your customer base uh continuing to grow yes last few years uh post pandemic it's been growing a lot wow yeah so it sounds like everything's going pretty well what's your biggest challenge right now Biggest challenge right now is actually the our company is growing at exponential rate. And uh, so making sure staffing has been a challenge mm -hmm. that I would say staffing is the biggest challenge, finding the right people, because a lot of people now going into this uh, at home work, I mean, Zoom calls and working from home, that space is kind of challenging because we still need people to uh, salespeople to knock on doors and do the deliveries and operational stuff. So finding staffing has been a big challenge for me. So do you have, do you have, are you running a hybrid organization where some people are remote and other people are working in, in the office of the warehouse? Yes, we, we, we have both models. And how's that working for you? It's working pretty well so far. It's just finding the right person for the right job. Um, it's kind of challenging because we need some people in different states. Florida example, for example, it's actually a pretty uh, growing market for us. So uh, finding like a pretty uh, operational and sales force has been a big challenge. So uh, it, 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 we find a where you've got to have warehousing in Florida to hold products that you can get to the distributors. Yes. So what happened was we actually uh, there was a company called American Hotel Register. They were the largest hotel supply, kind of the Home Depot of the right. hotel supplies. Uh, the, the 150 year old company. They went under during the pandemic. Unfortunately, we were supplying to them. So they left a huge void in the market for distribution in the U.S., which still hasn't been filled. Wow. So we are trying to get into that space right now. So we started an operation in Florida as well as Los Angeles. This is not just amenities, just all, all kinds of uh, hotel products. So uh, we are growing that market, uh, model as well. You're moving into the, the, into the distribution. Yes. Yes. Is there anything you don't do around this? I mean, <laughs> no, no. This is all. This is my strength, you know, hotel space. So we try to stay uh, within that space. Yeah. Wow. Well, you sound like you're a pretty busy guy. I am actually. Uh, yeah. 
the, the, uh, it's never been this busy in my life, to be honest with you. But I'm super excited these days, unlike before, because things are, when you know things are working out well, because you set goals and sometimes you can have a five-year goal or a 10-year goal, it might not work accordingly, right? So right now I feel like everything is coming into place. Good for you. I'm in that phase, yeah. Good for you. Yeah. I've got one more question for you because I know you're a busy man. And I oh, that's fine. You can have the time on the show. What's one thing about you, Andy, that we wouldn't know about unless you revealed it to us? One thing, uh, I think I revealed it, uh, the, my modeling thing in, back in Sri Lanka <laughs> to you. <laughs> yeah, and not a lot of people know about it. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, I value time. I value time, I respect time. You know, I have a lot, a lot of respect for people who value time and be on time because time is, I feel like time is one thing uh, people can never take get back. So uh, I'm always on time. Uh, so uh, yep. I, yeah, that's something not a lot of people know about me, but I'm that guy. Well, you showed up five minutes ahead of the podcast. I think you're the first guest <laughs> of the 120 guests I've had so far. <laughs> there, there you go. Well, thank you, Andy. It's been really great talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Have a good day.